simple message today. But it's very in keeping with our time of worship. It's very in keeping with that desire of heart um, that he would stir us. That new song. You know, well it, well, it may mess with some of your theologies and I'm not here to debate that today. The reality is, fall afresh on me, Lord Jesus. Mm. Fill me with yourself, Lord Jesus. Fill me with your presence, Lord. Less of me, more of you. Oh, the richness of the desire of the man and the woman of God who just wants to know him. The richness of that desire. That's, that's, what, that's what this is about this morning. That's what this, this story of, of Joel is about, you know. Have you, have, would you turn there? Would you go to Joel? We started in Joel a couple of weeks ago, and I'd appreciate some lights. That would help my, my old eyes. That would be nice. But um, we looked at the first chapter last time we were together. And as I said to you then, for me, uh, the theme of the book of Joel is that it's never too late. It's, it's never too late to, to acquire this thirst. It's never too late to embrace this hunger. It's never too late to, de to, to develop this appetite. It's, it's, it's never too late to turn from the wrong that we might know the right. It's never too late to turn from the wrong path to see our destiny and God just change. And it's, just, it's never too late to repent, is it? It's never too late to turn, to avoid the greater disaster. It's never too late to discover God's faithfulness to the greatness of his promises to us. We all know his promises to us, don't we? You know, we know them. And it's never too late to call upon the Lord to know that you are saved. It's just never too late. That's what this book is about. Never too late. Now, the subject matter, of course, is the day of the Lord. And as soon as we say, Joel, everyone, yes, let's get to the nitty gritty of it, you know. And, and Joel wants to get to the nitty gritty of it. That, that is true. The, the subject matter is the day of the Lord. The theme for me is that it's never too late to experience the salvation of God. This day of the Lord is mentioned five times in the book of Joel. It's mentioned in many places by the other writers in the, in the scriptures. But ultimately, what's the day of the Lord? Have you stopped and asked yourself, what, it, what is it? I mean, I don't want to... We'll get to it in the third chapter. But it, I'll, essentially, the day of the Lord is simply when God says, time enough. That, that's what it is. God says, time enough for mankind's rebellion. God will say, time enough for the wickedness of man's hatred and greed and pride and idolatries and adulteries and murders and fornications. Time enough. Because the scripture is so clear. You can read it in Ephesians chapter 5 and other places. The scripture is so clear that such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will not, you know. And the day of the Lord is when God will say, time enough. Time enough. And he will act decisively. Don't be fooled. Don't, 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 don't allow yourself... No, let me not jump ahead. God will act decisively. This is what the day of the Lord is going to be about. The presence of the Almighty will totally dominate humanity's reign of rebellion. And it will pale by comparison to his presence. No one will be asking in that day, prove to me that God exists. No one will. I mean, that's the question that is everywhere today in this very liberal world. That is true. But in that day, no one will be asking, prove to me that God exists because his presence will be so real in the world, you know. What does Isaiah say? Isaiah says in chapter 13, we'll visit these again in a couple of weeks. Isaiah says in chapter 13, wail, or, wail for the day of the Lord is hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. He says every hand will go limp and every man's heart will wilt. I mean, just try and gather that in your thoughts, in your consciousness, 
Every man's heart, every man's hand will go limp. Every man's heart will wilt. The cosmos itself, actually he says, he's, the cosmos, cosmos itself, the created universe itself will be in convulsions in that time at the presence of the Almighty when he returns to his earth. It says again in Isaiah that the sun will give no light and the moon will, and the stars will cease to shine. Joel's going to say later at the end of this chapter, we won't get there today, but Joel's going to say there will be wonders in the heavens and the earth and they're not wonders to sit in awe of and, 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 and be marveled by. No, the wonders of the heavens and the earth, he talks about blood, he talks about fire, he talks about pillars of, pillars of smoke. Now they're wonders, aren't they? They're wonders, you know. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon will be turned to blood, Joel will say. The New Testament connects the day of the Lord, to the return of Jesus Christ. It's the Lord's day. Peter, in Second Peter, his second epistle, he rather ominously just calls it the day of God. Isn't that a statement? The day of God. And then he goes on to describe the climax of humanity. He will say that the heavens will be dissolved being on fire and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. The presence of God Almighty will bring all things to their ultimate conclusion, some unto eternal judgment. But how wonderful it is that Peter tells us, nevertheless, that we, according to his promise, we look for what? A new heaven and a new earth wherein there dwells righteousness. It will be a time, it'll be a time of decision. Joel's going to refer to this. In the third chapter, he's going to talk about multitudes and multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near. Again, in the valley of decision, God will render his verdict and divine judgment will be executed. Isaiah again tells us in the second chapter that on that day, that day of decision, God will render, well, actually God will, will render his judgment against everything that is proud. And isn't that the problem with humanity? It's about man being proud. It's about man exalting himself. It's about man rejecting the honor and the rule and the will and the holiness of God and exchanging it for our own will and rule and our own righteousness. And he says everything, in fact he says, for the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud, everything lofty, everything lifted up and it shall be brought low. He will go on to say that the loftiness of man will be bowed down and the haughtiness of man shall be brought low. The Lord, Almighty, the Lord Almighty, the Lord Almighty is the only thing, he says, that will be exalted on that day. And we will get to it later. God will act. God will decide. Nations will be judged. It's going to happen, people. Nations will be judged again while others will enter into the blessedness of his salvation. We'll get there. We're in Joel's time. That's the subject matter of this book. And what I want to highlight this morning, it's very simple, is, is the heart of the people in the time of Joel when the message of the day of the Lord was brought to them. What was that heart like? Because I think you're going to find that it's very similar to the heart that we know today. Here's the thing. In Joel's time, Israel anticipated that for them, that the coming of God, the day of the Lord, was going to be a wonderful time. They, they anticipated that it would be a time of great prospects for them as a nation. They, they spoke of it as it's going to be a day of great light, of great light, because on that day, everybody else is going to get it. 
That's how they viewed it. On that day, everybody else is going to get it. In fact, anybody else who was not them is going to get it. That's how they viewed it. You see, their basic position was that they alone had the possession of God's truth and everybody else is damned. Everybody else. You see, God had made a covenant with them. And that's all that mattered. And, you know, the fact that they were worshipping idols really didn't come to play. The fact that they were disregarding God's command of holiness really didn't affect them. The fact that they were living like unbelievers, it did not matter to them. They were God's chosen people and everybody else was just on a slow roast. That's how they saw the world. Now with all that in mind... I want to read a quote to you. I found this in a Scripture Union magazine. It's a great little magazine. A guy by the name of Morris Stewart wrote this. He said, It is amazing how long, how long-held beliefs, however ill-founded, can often supplant the truth. Heresy, if repeated often enough, becomes orthodoxy. In other words, it can become accepted as truth. And thus, truth through lack of rehearsal or practice or examination, he says, can become untruth. So, yes, Israel was in covenant with Almighty God. Yes. But that covenant, and it's the same for you and I today, but that covenant was to effect and identify them as God's people by virtue of the fact that they serve the one true holy God. That, that, that was the light that was to shine from their lives. You know, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, God said, you are my people. You are my people. You are a holy people. That's what he said to them. I've chosen you. In Isaiah chapter 43, sorry, the Jehovah Witnesses, this is not written about you. But Isaiah chapter 43 was written about the Hebrew people. He said, you are my witnesses says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I even I am the Lord, and besides me there is no other Savior. I have declared and I have saved. I have proclaimed and there were no foreign gods, that and there shall be no foreign gods amongst you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says the Lord. What? That I am God. You see, they were to shine a light. They were to be the witnesses to the world that the one true God is a holy God. What they were to be, as you and I are also to be as Christians today, they were to be an invitation to mankind. That's what life was meant to be. So think about all of that. A chosen nation set apart to be a holy people. To be a testament of the true and the living God, the one and only holy God. How does that affect their lives? Well, again, they lived unholy lives. They worshipped multiple gods. But we are God's chosen people. I'll say it again. They lived unholy lives. They worshipped multiple gods. But their cry was, we are God's chosen people. And they kept on telling themselves that. They kept on telling themselves that. It didn't matter that they lived like the rest of the heathen humanity. That didn't matter at all. We are God's people. We are people of promise. And everyone else will only ever be fuel for the fodder of fire's hell. The fire's hell's fire. Excuse my grammar. I'm getting lost here. You know me. But stop and think about it. Generation after generation after generation, they thought the same thing. And that heresy became truth unto them. What did they become? They became self-indulgent. They became smug. They be Is this ringing bells? They became self-satisfied people. That doesn't ring an association. Let me give you a list of words, 
a list of words that describes them. Uninterested, indifferent, unconcerned, unmoved, unresponsive, impa Im Im impassive, detached, disinterested, lukewarm, uncaring, non-committal. They don't care that the world around them is dying. And they don't really care how they live. Why? Because we're God's people. Because we've got a ticket. We've said a prayer. We've stood before an altar. We've made a sacrifice. We are God's chosen people. We're going to heaven and you, you are going, well, I don't really care. I, I really don't care. No enthusiasm, no concern. What's it called? It's called apathy. That's what it's called. They had slipped into this state of, of complacency and apathy about the things of God. Now it's ringing bells, isn't it? Now it really is, you know. And you and I really need to be aware that the same thing is happening today. It just is. In these days of indifference about spiritual things, when the Word of God is being polluted and, and dissected and pull apart and we'll have this and we won't have that, but this will be okay, but we'll get rid of that, you know. And we're embracing all these non-Christian cultures and we're starting to say yes to things that God has said no to since the beginning of time. Apathy. You know, it's a generational thing. You know, you meet people sometimes, right? Do, do you remember being at school and, and there would be kids, you know, and, and you looked at them and you thought, they're just weird people. They just think weird things. They do weird things, you know. And then you go and, you know, for some reason you end up in their backyard playing with them and their dad comes outside. And he looks, he's doing weird things. He's saying the same things that the kids were saying. It's a generational thing. You know, it just passes from generation to generation until it becomes, you know? You know, we mock and we look at other cultures. We look at, you know, redneck cultures in the United States and we, you know, there's whole, there's whole genres of television programs all about those people, isn't there? And we watch them, you know, and they, they, their idea of a great time is to crawl around in a muddy creek and stick their arm under this hole and allow this massive fish to latch onto the back of their arm, pull the thing out. Yeah, man has conquered. It's weird. <laughs> it's funny we laugh at it. Are you doing that? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's generational. But you know, the same thing happens when it comes to the knowledge of God and what is truth and what isn't truth. And as that quote from that magazine said, it's so easy for untruth to become orthodox, to become truth unto us. You know, there needs to be a shaken up. I love that new song. Again, it might mess with your theology, but I love that new song. It needs to be a shake up. It needs to be a wake up. You know, and that's what God is doing with the, his people that have slipped into this ap apathy to shake them, to wake them, to get their attention. Remember, we saw this last time we were together in Joel. God called, or God allowed, I should say, a, a, a plague of locusts to devour the land. Do you remember the story? I mean, the land was ruined. It was absolutely desolate. Everything green was gone. Famine was in the land. Every branch of every trunk of every living thing was stripped bare and the whole landscape just looked like white death everywhere they looked. Fires broke out and destroyed whatever was, was left. The cattle and the sheep were, were perishing. The vineyards were laid waste. The temple sacrifices, even they ceased because there was nothing to offer unto their God. And even the drunks... Even the drunks, because of the destruction of the vineyards, were drying out and wondering what's going on, you know. So they're discouraged. They're demoralized. 
That's their practical reality. You might say that for them, please see it, they say, you might say for them, life sucked. And for them, it sucked as bad as, about as, about as, bad as it could suck. It sucked badly, right? Now, what God is doing here, he, he, he takes this state of devastation as a warning of what the day of the Lord is to be like. And he takes the immediate difficult reality and he blends it into the greater future devastation that's going to befall mankind called the day of the Lord. There's a lot of people just roaming through life, even Christians, who just don't like life. You know, they're apathetic. They're not seeking holiness. They're not honouring God in their lives and they're wondering why things don't work out. You know, they live these compromised Christian lives. I've had people come to me and they've said this, why won't God just give me a break? But you're living like a heathen man and you want the blessing of God in your life. You know? And sometimes we need to be shaken. We need to be woken. But sadly, sometimes in this state, I hear people say it, they're living like heathens, and they're saying, oh, I just want the Lord to come back. I'm thinking, no, you don't. Oh, no, you don't. And maybe there's a sentiment of this in Israel because they longed for the day of the Lord because it's going to be a day of great light and deliverance for them and death and carnage to everybody else. Remember, they're toast. That's how they were living. And so God brings this destruction upon their land to blend the immediate difficulty into the reality that something so, so much more severe is going to befall a God-rejecting people. And you know what God is saying in this passage? I've just said it already. He's just saying you're not ready. You're just not ready. You're not ready for my coming. Look, if I was to ask for a show of hands, who would say, yes, Lord, bring it on. Come on, God. Get me out of this place. Well, I hope every one of us would say that because we love him, because we honor him with our lives, because we know of the great sacrifice that has been paid, that we might be forgiven of our sins, that we might pursue holiness and be righteous, holy people, living examples of the living God to this dying world. And we want to give our every breath for the service of the kingdom. Lord, bring it on. You know, here's what Amos, we don't really know when Joel was, when Joel was speaking. We don't really have the right, the time exactly when he lived. But Amos would say, the prophet, he would say, woe unto you that desire, this is Amos chapter 5 and verse 18. He would say, woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord to what end is it for you? Now, you that are looking forward to the day of the Lord, what end is it for you? What's it going to bring for you? And he says, for the day of the Lord is darkness. It's not light. And he goes on to say in verse 19, it's as if a man would flee from a lion and a bear would meet him. The thinking is that there are so many again that are just not ready. Let me repeat myself. The Jews believed that they were selected. And it really didn't matter how they lived their lives. And Amos is saying here, if this life is tough, and you feel like, well, you're just being chased by a lion. Don't take comfort in the fact that the next life is going to be any better for you if you're not trusting in the Lord because it's going to be like escaping from a lion only to fall into the hands of a bear. That's what he says. Someone said this. Someone said, too many people place their trust in the idea of God rather than the God of the idea. 
I thought it's a great quote. Because you know we have all these ideas about God, don't we? We have all these ideas about how we should, or who we should, what our Christian life should look like. And we generally see it through the filter of our own culture. And sadly, too many of us see it through the, own, the filter of our own humanistic desires, you know. And, trendy, and, 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 and the trendy ideas that we adopt so sadly are more often ideas about God that placate to, well, to our varying degrees of carnality. Am I being offensive to you today? They so often placate to our own lack of, of urgency. You know, we know in, heart, in our heart that God wants us to be vibrant in our life for him. We know that he wants us to be the hands, right? The hands of Jesus in this world. We know that we are called, like Israel were called, to be witnesses of the one true living holy God. We, we know that. But here's the thing. If our idea of God is worship on a Sunday morning, if that's what our idea of, of God is, if our idea of God is that he makes me happy, he wants to pay my bills, and he wants to make sure I don't get a cold in winter time, and now you think I'm being facetious. But you know what? A lot of people... That's who God is. He makes me happy. If I'm not happy, well, where's God? He pays my bills. Well, if the bank account's not looking good, where's God? And if I've got a cold, oh my goodness. You know, <laughs> excuse me for being facetious, you know. Excuse me, but if that's our idea of God... Or if our idea of God is just some ecstatic experience that divorces itself from the authority of God's word. If, if, if our idea of God knows nothing of holiness, is this who God is? If our idea of God knows nothing of holiness, nothing about, about the servant heart of, of, of God, of Christ, if our idea of God knows nothing about self-denial and spiritual growth, if our idea of God is not rooted in a hungering desire to know him and to be like him, if we are not broken by our sin, if we're not humbled by his mercy, if we're not in awe of his majesty, then, then we're not ready for his coming. We're not ready. Please understand, I'm, I'm not seeking to condemn anyone here, but, but rather to spark a flame, fan a flame, spark a fire, however you see it. You know, I plead with God. That's why I love that song this morning. I know, fall on me, Holy Spirit. Fall afresh, come like that fire. You know, I love, I love Acts chapter, I heard that song, you know, and it took me straight to Acts chapter 10 because it talked about the believers gathering together in the house of Cornelius and they said the Holy Spirit fell upon them like he did the first time back in, back in Israel, back in Jerusalem, you know, just like he did back then, you know. Don't you want it? You know, this is my prayer for us. This is my prayer for us, you know, that, that I plead that the Holy Spirit would just arouse us from our slumber. That worship would become passionate because he alone is worthy of it. Not because I like the song or I think that's a good singer, but because God is holy and I am not. Oh, this, this is it, people. This is what it's really all about. We need to know that the apathy and the, the lukewarmness that so many of us live our lives in reduces our witness to, to nothing more than at very best a curiosity to them out there. So what do you do? Where do you go? What's that about? We need 
to be holy. We need to be bold, vibrant for Jesus. We need this heartfelt passion. We need to stop being a casual observer and become a fervent participant in kingdom things. Not enamored by earthly pursuits, no. You know, I need to be concerned about eternal issues. And I've got to understand the times in which I live. You know, we often quote Jesus when he said, as in the days of Noah, as in the days of Lot. Remember that, you know? And we often, we look at that passage and we think that, you know, and rightly so, that, that it's talking about the degradation of society and, and, the, and the rebellion of man and the turking, turning away from God's morality. We, we know that. It, yes, that's true. But you know, it's not the chief sign. It's not the chief sign that Jesus gives. The chief sign that Jesus gives for the day of the Lord, for the return of Christ, is that one there. Apathy. As in the days, what were they doing? They were giving in marriage. What were they doing? They were just living life as normal with no sense of urgency, as if nothing is going to change. And God got relegated to a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, relegated to some partition of my life. He, he, he wants to be your life. Because life without him is nothing. That's what this is about, you know. We need a heartfelt passion. We need to stop being casual observers, let me say it again, and become fervent participants in kingdom things. Look, I haven't even read the passage, have I? Let's quickly read it. Let's quickly read it. You, you'll get it. Maybe, maybe it might make a little more sense now. It is the Old Testament after all. Look what he says. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord comes, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spreads upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever like, neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Remember, they had looked at, they'd experienced this plague of locusts that had been like a cloud coming upon them, devouring the land. And they said, we've never seen anything like it before. And God is projecting that out to the day of the Lord, to the final destruction of humanity and the establishing of the kingdom of God. Can you see, the, can you see what he's doing? A fire devours, verse 3, before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is the appearance of horses, as horsemen as they shall run. Like the noise of chariots on top of the mountains, they shall leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devours and, and the stubble as, it's, as a strong people set in a battle array. Before their face, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather in blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the walls like men of war. And they shall march every one on his way, and they shall not break their ranks. He's talking about a total invading destruction. If you can just, if you can just imagine you know, a plague of locusts coming and just moving through the land. And as we said the other week, in front of them there is the rich lushness of, of vegetation, but behind them there is only death. And he's talking about the, the judgment of God coming upon a Christ-rejecting world. And, he's, and the imagery is very similar. 
Neither shall one, verse 8, thrust another. They shall walk everyone in this, his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run. That's an interesting verse. I'm going to come back to that and we get to chapter 3. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run up the walls. They shall climb up upon the house. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. No one's going to escape. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. For the camp is very great. For he is strong that executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? Now look at this. Therefore, also now, that's important. He's saying, this is what coming. But then he says, therefore, also now, says the Lord. Turn ye every, even to me, with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rent your heart and not your garments turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and great in kindness and repenteth him of the evil who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him? Even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders. Notice who he's calling. He's calling everybody. Assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber. So those that are preparing their life to be married, let them turn back and trust in the Lord and the bride out of her closet. The same idea. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say amongst the people, where is their God? You know what I love about these verses? I mean, I, I encourage you, you go back and read them. What I love about these verses is it simply says, it's never too late. That's what it says to us. I look around, and I know you do too. We live in a society that, as Isaiah said, calls evil good and good evil. It is everywhere. You know, I've got this quote at home. I stole it from, from a, a pastor some time ago, and I've, and I've kept it, and I, and I dragged it out, and I thought, I've got to read this to you. I mean, because he captures, he captures where we're at so, so, so well and so simplistically. Let me read it to you again. Forgive me, this is not my work. And I don't even know who he was. I just read it once. But yes, that's, that's solid. He said this, We are living in a society that protects the wicked and punishes the righteous. We are living in a world where fear has replaced faith. Sin has replaced sanity. Greed has replaced God. And hatred has replaced holiness. You can see it in our homes. You can see it in our population. You can see it in our streets. You can see it in our entertainment. And most devastating of all, you can see it in our churches. Preaching has become replaced by praise songs. Holiness has given way to happiness. Commitment has been replaced by complacencies. Our pews are full, but our altars are empty. We get more excited about a shopping trip than we do about revival. We wink at sin and wince at the holy demands of God. We have lost our fire, our power, and our desire for the things of God. We would rather play than pray. We would rather have our ears tickled than our hearts searched by the word. We would rather be entertained than challenged. And here's the devastating reality. We would rather stay like we are than become more like him that's apathy that's apathy that's an indicting truth isn't it 
But Joel reminds us, this is why I love this old book, you know. Therefore, also now. That means, hey, right now, even though all of this is so right now, even though the very core of the heart might be rotten, even thus right now, we can turn to God with all our hearts. Isn't that wonderful? It can be so rotten. We can be so far from God. We can be so consumed with ourselves and so indifferent to spiritual things. We can still turn to God with all our hearts. And that's why I say at every single funeral service I do, one of the last things I always say, I did a service the other day. The culture that was there. Oh, it was. I'm just. I'm. 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 I'm asking myself. Should I say? It was so godless, you know. It was so rebellious. And the last thing I said to them was, do not be indifferent to spiritual things. That's because, I say that because I know. While they were not interested in the God I worship, it wasn't too late. It's never too late. That's the message of, of, of Joel, you know. I'll say it again. Even though the very core of the heart is rotten, and I don't know where you are with God right now. I don't know what the passion of your lives are. All I know is right now, right now, every single one of us in this room can turn to God with all of our hearts. Every single one of us. What did he say in verse 12? Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all of your hearts and with fastings and with weepings and with mournings. Look what he said. And rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God. Rend your heart and not your garments. He's not looking for a religious performance. He's not looking just for church attendance. No, he wants your heart. He wants your heart. If there is sin in your life today, Christian, let your heart be broken. Let it break your heart. Turn around and walk away in the other direction. Disdain it just like God disdains it. And if you can't disdain it, then take yourself back to the cross and look at Jesus. Look at him upon the cross. See him dying in your place. See the brutality that was perpetrated against him. See every drop of precious, perfect blood flow from his veins. See that crown of thorns thrust into his head, that spear in his side, the vile ridicule that was, that was taunted at him. See it all and realize that's how much God loves you and that is the price that God was willing to pay that you can be forgiven if you can't hate your sin. If you can't turn from it, turn to Jesus. Turn to the cross and see what he bore for you. Disdain what God disdains. And notice that he's not mad at you. That he's not angry at you. What, what, did, what did Joel say? God is gracious. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. A great in kindness. He relents from doing harm. He's holding it back, people. He's holding it back so you can come to him. You know. You need to fear God. 
you can boldly, boldly come to him. He's not angry. Again, gracious, merciful, slow to anger, great in kindness. He wants us to be honest. That's all. Be open with him. Get real with him. That's a a simple message. Let the pretense be gone. Let the practice be gone. He just wants to meet with you face to face. Today and every other day of your lives. Can can I just end with, with what Isaiah said? He says in chapter 1 and verse 16, turn there if you want. He said, He said, wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. He says, cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Come and talk to me. Just bring it all to me. Though your skins be your sins be red as scarlet, you shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He said, If you be willing, are you willing this morning? If you be willing and obedient, what does he say? You shall eat the good of the land. Now, I would like to finish with that verse, but that's not being honest with you. Because the next verse, but if you refuse and you rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. He calls us to come back to him, even in this late, late hour. He wants you to get hungry. Did you hear the prayer from the worship? To get hungry, to hunger and thirst after his righteousness. God wants you to come back to him just one more time. He wants you back. He wants us back. So let me, let us be honest. We put so many things ahead of God just got to get him first enough of the apathy enough of producing things that have no eternal value but lord whatever you want there's a prayer that i pray and and i would that we would all pray it with sincerity will you will you pray it with me this morning Father in heaven, Lord, whatever you need to do, whatever you need to bring into my life, Lord, my heart is open. And Lord, whatever you need to take, Father, I release my hands. Lord, I ask you, Father, to shine the light of your conviction upon my heart. Lord, into those secret dark chambers where I sit upon a throne. Lord, shine your light. Show us your way in a fresh and new way. Holy Spirit, fall afresh upon us. Ignite the flame. Rekindle the fire. We thank you, Lord, for the wonder of your great love. But Lord, let us not be deceived. You're a just God. 
You're a holy God. And you're the only God. As your people, Lord, we drop Father to our knees and we ask you, Father, to place your hand upon us. We humble ourselves before you, Almighty One, that in due time you might exalt us, Lord. Father, I pray that these words are not just man's, but Spirit of God, you would arrest our hearts. Let things change from this day. For your glory, for your praise, make us ready, Lord, that this world looking upon us knows that we have something of infinite value. Thank you in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Amen.